So the Insta360 X3 is one of my favorite cameras released in 2022. Now, I personally don't view the X3 as a replacement for other cameras. I kind of view it as in a class of its own. This camera films 360 degree footage. I really like the finished product and I really like the software that Insta360 has for reframing that footage and getting that footage to look exactly as you want it to. As I've said before, that's really where the magic happens with this camera. It's not so much in the filming process, but it's how you reframe it afterwards to tell your story. But for today's video, my focus is going to be on giving you the very best settings to get the very best footage out of this camera so that later on when you reframe it, you're gonna get the best possible result. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna go through the best settings for video, the best settings for photo, and then the best settings for time lapses on here. Now, before we get started, it is important to make sure you're on the latest firmware version because some of the options I'm going to show you today, you may not see unless you're on the latest firmware. The way you can tell if you're on the latest firmware is connect this with the app on your phone and the app will tell you if you're on the latest firmware version or if you need to install it. So if you do need to update, I recommend doing that first and then we'll get started with the best settings. And you'll of course wanna have the screen of the camera facing toward you as you adjust the settings on here. And so I've swiped down here to show you the main menu because I wanna show a few settings here that are kind of applied to all modes. So the first one with the audio settings, this is really gonna depend on what you're doing and what you're filming. But generally I have it do the direction focus. And I like this because when you reframe it later on, it's going to enhance the audio according to the viewing direction. So it's going to record from all sides, but then the audio that it brings out, it's gonna depend on how you reframe it later on. So if you have someone talking on one side of the camera and someone talking on the other, when you reframe it later on, whoever you're pointing at, their voice is going to come out louder than the other person's voice. So I kind of like that. Now there are use cases where that would not be useful, but there are a lot of use cases where that would. So I like to set mine to that. You've got some other settings here like quick capture on or off. If you push this button and it's turned off, it's going to make the camera turn on and it's gonna start recording. So that can be useful if you want to do that. Personally, I just powered on and then started recording. But if you want to do that, you can do so. This mode here is the vibration setting. I like that because when you push a button, if you wanna have the sound off, the camera will still vibrate and let you know that you've pushed a button there. And the indicator light, I like keeping that on as well. That's down here at the bottom. It's very useful. The volume you can adjust here. I generally keep mine to low or medium. High is a little bit too loud, but if you want to mute it entirely, you can do that as well. I'm gonna set this to low here. Most of these other settings will not apply, but if you do have a lens guard on, you'll wanna select this here. That's gonna help you with the stabilization and stitching effects if you have lens guards on. But if you don't, like me, I'm just gonna remove that. If you select this here, that's gonna lock your screen. So if you do that, your screen is not going to respond to you touching it. So if you're worried about accidentally tapping it, you might wanna lock your screen. So if you lock it like that, particularly dive case mode as it mentions here, and then you would slide up to unlock. Cause you want it locked if you're underwater, the water touching your screen is going to do all kinds of presses on there and it's gonna mess up what you're recording. And then if you go over to this one here, this has a few other specific settings that you probably want to change. So the first one you wanna do is you wanna to go to anti-flicker and you wanna make sure that's set to either auto or the setting for your country. So here in the United States, it would be 60 Hertz, but a lot of other countries, it's gonna be 50. So you wanna make sure you select that. If you're not sure, just do auto. But if you do know, I recommend just setting it manually here. For the bit rate, I definitely recommend setting this to high. You wanna get the very highest quality out of your footage. And if you don't set that to high, it's going to limit the quality and you're not gonna get as good of results. Yes, the file size will be much bigger, but you wanna get the very best quality out of this little camera. For the video sharpness, this is a preference here, but I don't recommend high or highest. It's not good to have video that's overly sharp. It just does not look good. You can always add sharpness later on if you feel like your video doesn't have enough of it, but I recommend doing low or medium. With this particular camera, I generally keep it at medium. I find that medium gives me the best balance of results, 
but sometimes I will also do low if I want to add a little sharpness later on when editing. So I'm going to keep it set to medium there. And here's your auto sleep and auto power off settings. I usually have auto sleep set to never, but I have auto power off set to five minutes. So if I accidentally power this on and I haven't touched it for five minutes, it's going to power off and it's not going to eat up my battery entirely. And then the SD card, if you need to reformat it, you would do that right here. You would click format. Do note that formatting does erase everything on your card, but if you're having problems with it or on a regular interval, I do recommend formatting. I usually do it about once a month, but if I'm using this like every day for a while, I usually copy my footage off and format about once a week. That just tends to keep things working smoothly. In the end, it tends to result in less lost footage. And then down here, you've got a couple other things you can do, like you can customize the button down here on the right. So what I have for that button, I have it set to switch between single lens and 360 mode. It's nice to be able to press that and do that. You also can have it do the take photo or record video. You can swap between those modes. I prefer the top, so I'm gonna keep it at that. And then the gyro calibration. If you need to recalibrate this, if you feel like it's not stabilizing properly, you can click the start calibration and it's gonna send you through all the steps here. So I'll show you what that does here really quick. It's gonna say processing at the bottom. And then when it's done, it's gonna say it was successful. Then if for any reason you ever have to do an entire reset of the camera, you're gonna go down here to factory reset. If you're having any bugginess with it, that can sometimes be a great first step to kind of narrow that down. But I haven't had to do that yet, so hopefully uh, things will stay that way. If you did need to, that's where you would do it. Let's dive into the settings for each mode now. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to toggle left and right, and we're gonna make sure we're on the video mode first. Once you're on the video mode, you're gonna click here. And what we wanna do is we wanna go down to the bottom where it says 5.7K30, and that's gonna take us into the settings. So the highest resolution and frame rate you can do in the normal video mode is 5.7K30. And to be clear, that 5.7K resolution is the entirety of the 360 degrees. So when you do export it later on, you're gonna be able to export it into a 1080p finished product if you do it in a 4K, the quality is not gonna be there. This footage is meant to be 1080p for the final result. So you'll want to keep that in mind so that your expectations are set there ahead of time. But 5.7K, I highly recommend recording in that. And then for your frame rate, 30, 25, or 24 are the options. Depending on what your finished product timeline is gonna be, you might want to tweak those settings there but I recommend sticking with the 30. That gives you a slight bit of slowdown flexibility if you wanna do some slow motion from that. You can do extensive slow motion. You can slow it down by about 20% if you're on a 24 frames per second timeline. Now, if you do want to do some more extreme slow motion, you could go to 4K and you could do 4K 60 there. And if you do 4K 60 on a 24 frames per second timeline, you can slow it down to 40% of the original speed. So it's gonna be largely what you want to do with that footage, but I recommend doing at least 4K 60, and if not 4K 60, do 5.7K 30. After we've set that, we're gonna go back here and we're gonna swipe left from the right side. This is where we're gonna get some of our other key settings here. So let's start on the left side. This is our color profile. So you've got three options here. You've got log, standard, or vivid. Vivid is gonna be that really saturated color mode. This is gonna be high, high saturation. So if you want that straight out of camera and you don't wanna do any color adjusting later on, that might be a great mode for you to select. If you do want to do extensive grading later on, you'll wanna select Log. And the great thing about Log is you can do a lot of color grading. You can really customize that footage how you want it to look. And Insta360 does have a LUT that you can download that you can easily drop on your footage to color correct and it makes it pretty easy to do a lot of that editing. So if you do it in log, I encourage you to get that LUT as well to use in your video editing software. I've linked to that LUT in the description below so that you can easily find that. And finally, standard, that's gonna be kind of the normal natural color profile. So the idea with standard is that footage should look pretty much as you see it when you film it, but it's not going to have the same editing flexibility later on that log will have. 
For the white balance, you could leave that at auto if you want to, but I like customizing that a little bit because it does make it easier later on if all your footage is set to the same value. So if you're filming during the daytime, I recommend either 5000K or 5500K. 5000K is gonna be a little bit less warm, so a little bit more blues in the footage. And 5500K is gonna be slightly warmer and a little bit more yellow in the footage. I prefer 5500K, I like that slight warmth there, but it's largely up to you what your preference is. And then if you are doing sunrise or sunset, I recommend changing this to 6500K. That's gonna really help bring out those colors that occur during the golden hour, and your footage is gonna look extra good if you have it with 6500K white balance at sunrise or sunset. For EV comp, I do recommend adjusting this to negative 0.5. Like most action cameras, this camera does tend to overblow the highlights and you kind of lose detail there, especially in things like clouds on a sunny day. So I recommend doing negative 0.5, that preserves a lot of that detail. And then when you're editing later on, if you drop the LUT on there or you're doing other customizations, it's gonna tend to have more detail available and it's gonna look better. And then finally, this last setting here, you can do isolated exposure or you can have this off. I generally keep that off. I find that that works best when you're doing the 360 degree. It tends to balance everything out there. So I prefer keeping that off. We're gonna swipe back right now. And now that we've done that, what I wanna do next is I wanna set up the settings for the single video mode. So we're gonna go back here. And when we do that, when we swipe left or right, you're gonna see the single lens option here at the top. So we're gonna select that, go back to video. And this is gonna have a little bit more limited options here because it is a single lens mode. So this is gonna be the lens when it's facing you. So what we're gonna do down here is we're gonna have a couple different options. Now, what I recommend is I recommend doing 16 by nine here for the ratio, and that's the default field of view. And then I recommend doing 4K 30. 4K 30 is the highest you can go here because you are using just one of the lens, you're not doing 360 footage. So this is great if you're talking to the camera or if you own this camera and you want to do scenes that aren't 360 to put into your project, this is when you would want to use single lens mode. I find myself not using single lens mode often with this camera because the reason I have it is for the 360 degree capabilities. But if this is the one action camera that you want to own, you don't want to own any others and you want to do single lens stuff, this is where you would do those settings. So I recommend doing 4K 30, but if for some reason you do want some slow motion, you can go to 3.6K 60, and you don't lose a lot of resolution, but you can get footage that you can then slow down up to 40% of the original speed. So that does give you a little bit extra flexibility there. And by the way, if you do field of view plus, that gives you a little bit wider field of view but you can only do up to 2.7K there. So it does bump down the quality of the footage you can get by quite a bit. And if you did ultra wide plus, it mentions that does have distortion. You can do action plus for fast moving action. You can do max. That's gonna be the widest, widest angle with distortion. And then you also can do linear, which is narrow. So if you click on linear, that also still only offers up to 2.7K 60. So you can set up these various modes here though. I recommend sticking with the default field of view with 16.9, just because this is single lens mode, I recommend doing it that way. But I wanted you to see those to know that there are other options available if you would like to do those. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna click on 360 because that is what I wanna keep as my default there. So the next mode we're gonna go to here is HDR and it's called Active HDR Mode. So when we click on that, we're gonna go down here, and this can, again, be set to 5.7K 30. That's gonna be the highest that we can set it to. But you'll notice here, there are no other options for resolution. You have to do 5.7K. You can adjust the frame rate. You've got a few options there. I recommend doing 5.7K 30, because you can always drop that on a 24 frames per second timeline and have it be the normal speed or you can slow it down to 80% of the original speed. So now we're gonna go back to the main screen. We're gonna swipe left. But in this mode, you have very limited flexibility there. So you can set the white balance and that's about it. 
So I'm going to set the white balance here, like I mentioned for the normal video mode. I'm going to keep it at 5,500K, but 5,000 or 5,500K are great options for the daytime. But of course, if it is sunrise or sunset, then I recommend doing 6,500K there. And that is how you set up the active HDR mode. Now, what I like about Active HDR is this is great for footage that you just want to take out of the camera and reframe it. You don't really want to do any other grading with it or anything else like that. And I have filmed a lot of footage with Active HDR and I really like the outcome. So I do find myself using that mode often. It's really one of the simplest ones. And this camera does a really good job in that mode. So I do like that mode a lot. So if you want to start off simple and just have footage to reframe later on without needing to do further editing, I do recommend the active HDR mode. All right, let's go back here and we're going to go to the next mode, which is going to be time lapse. Let's click on that. And time lapse is pretty incredible on here. So this camera shoots a 360 degree time lapse and it shoots it in 8K resolution, which is really quite incredible. What you can do later on is you can add motion to that time lapse. So you can have your camera pan around, you can have it pan up, you can have it zoom in, zoom out when you're reframing it. You can do a lot of stuff. So all you have to do is have your camera sitting here recording that time lapse. And then later on, you've got a lot of flexibility. So I recommend for this always staying in the 8K resolution. You want to have the most possible quality to work with there. And then for the frame rate, I recommend the 30 as well. Because again, you can always drop that on a timeline of 24 frames per second and have it be normal speed or slow it down slightly if you want to. For the interval up here, this is really just going to depend on what's going on in your time lapse. So I had this set to two seconds because I did a quick time lapse during the day the other day where I didn't have it going for long. I had it going about 10 minutes when we reached a summit of a mountain. But if you're going to have it outside for a couple hours running, I would recommend doing a time lapse interval of four seconds for that. Uh, that's a great interval for clouds. And if you're gonna have it going for longer than that and you have it hooked to a external battery pack or something and say you wanted it to go all day, you might wanna do an interval of 10 seconds or 30 seconds for that. But you can also go a lot higher with the interval. You can go all the way up to 120 seconds. So that's going to be 120 seconds between each frame if you did it with that interval. But I usually prefer the two second or four second interval. We're gonna swipe down, then we're gonna swipe left. And these are gonna be our settings for our color profile. So here again, you can select standard, log, or vivid. And like I said before, this is just gonna depend on how much grading you want to do with this later on. I like to do log because it gives me maximum flexibility. If you don't want to do any color grading later on, I recommend sticking with standard. For white balance, again, if it's during the day, do 5,000K or 5,500K. 5,000K is a little cooler, 5,500K is a little warmer. And if it is a sunrise or sunset, do 6,500K, and that time lapse is gonna look extra good. For the EV comp, I definitely recommend keeping that at negative 0.5. Especially with time lapses, chances are there's probably gonna be some clouds in there and it's gonna really help preserve a lot of that rich detail in those clouds, so I recommend doing negative 0.5. And you can always bump up the exposure slightly if you need to when editing later on, but I recommend the negative 0.5. And then this I'm going to keep off once again, but if you want to isolate that exposure, say you're pointing at uh, clouds like a sunrise sunset, and you really wanna focus on that part of the sky, you could do the isolated exposure and it could help you get better results there. But in general, I still find that I keep this off. I still like how that works because it gives me better flexibility later on when editing. And that is the time-lapse mode. Let's go on to the next mode now, which is gonna be time shift. And this is gonna basically be hyperlapse equivalent. So this is gonna be a time-lapse that you can have going while you're moving. So let's say you're driving down a road Let's say you're hiking along a trail. Let's say you're walking through a city on the street. This is the mode you wanna use there. So for this, again, I recommend doing 5.7K 30. You wanna do the highest resolution and frame rate possible. And then for the settings here, same things again. I recommend keeping this at log, unless you don't wanna color correct, and then do standard. White balance, same rules applies with video and time-lapse. 
5,000K if you want it a little cooler, 5,500K for a little warmer, and 6,500K if it's sunrise or sunset. EV comp, keep that at negative 0.5 as well. And isolated exposure, I recommend keeping it off unless you're only gonna be getting this footage from one part of your frame. And then isolated exposure could be useful there, but I still recommend keeping it off. Next, we have star lapse mode. So star lapse mode is a fun one on here. It's obviously gonna look very white because that, that shutter speed is set very high because it's meant to do a star lapse. So what we're gonna do here, so we're gonna click at the bottom and we're gonna do some configuring. So for the resolution, you are limited to 18 megapixels and the timer is off by default. So there's not really much to change in those settings, but we're gonna swipe back down and we're gonna swipe left. And here's where we can adjust a lot of settings for this. So this is gonna offer you a couple options here. So I personally like to do the INSP plus raw because having those raw photos later on gives you more flexibility while editing. It will take up a lot more space on your memory card. So you do wanna have a big enough memory card if you do that. This is gonna be your shutter setting here. And shutter speed, we of course, you can go way down to, uh, to the left, but obviously for filming outside at nighttime, you wanna have a shutter speed that's pretty high. So if it's a dark, dark starry night, you wanna keep that shutter speed at about 30 seconds, but it can go up quite high. But the thing is, if you have your shutter speed set to 50 or 60 or higher, your interval between each photo is going to be at least that or longer. So in other words, if you want a 30 second interval between each shot, you're going to have to keep it set to 30 or below. If you have it above 30, like say at 60, then you're gonna have a minute between each shot. And if you do that all night, that doesn't really give you a long clip at the end. It's gonna be very quick. So I recommend setting it to 30 and that's gonna kind of give you that balance of having a long enough star lapse from the night versus not having enough to work with. It's better to have a little more to work with and 30 seconds is plenty long for capturing the night sky when it's dark. For the ISO, I recommend keeping that at 800 at nighttime. It's gonna be a good setting where you kind of balance the noise in your footage while also getting the most detail in the footage without it being too noisy. Anything above 800 tends to be too noisy and pretty much unusable, so I don't recommend doing that. For your white balance at nighttime, I recommend setting that to anywhere from 3200 up to about 4000K. I personally prefer 3200K for nighttime. I find that works best. So I recommend leaving that at 3200K. And then for the exposure, I recommend keeping that set to off. And the next mode here is burst. And that's going to be a photo mode. I'm not going to show you the settings specifically in burst, but I'm going to show you the settings in the photo mode. And those are going to pretty much carry over to burst. So HDR photo here, this is a fun mode. It's kind of similar to HDR video. And you're not going to have to change a lot of settings in this, but there are a few I wanna show you. So for the resolution in HDR photo, you are limited to 18 megapixels. And I do like to have the timer set at three seconds. That gives you time to push the button here to start it taking the photo. And it gives you time to get away from the camera and out of the way. And if the camera's shaking a little, it generally is gonna stop shaking that amount of time. But if you need a little more time, like say you're in a group photo and you need to run back and get with the rest of the crew, you can do up to 15 seconds. So when you do that, you hit this and the photo won't take for 15 seconds from when you push the button. I generally keep it set at three seconds. I find that works best for me. We're gonna swipe left and you're gonna have quite a few settings here that you can change. So if you're doing the HDR moto, I recommend keeping the pure shot. I think that looks best versus the INSP. For the white balance, it's gonna be the same rules as the others. If it's daytime, you want it a little cooler, do 5,000K. If you want it a little warmer, do 5,500K. And then if it's sunrise or sunset, do 6,500K. AEB stands for auto exposure bracket. And it's kind of a neat feature. What it does is it takes simultaneous photos with different exposures to them. And then it kind of merges those to get the best result. So for this, I actually like going higher here. I like having it set on nine. 
So it takes nine different photos with different exposures and then it puts them together and gets the best results for each part of the photo. So I like keeping that set to nine. And then for the EV comp here, I like putting that down to plus or minus 0.3, like having that as low as possible. That is how we set the HDR photo mode. I'm gonna swipe one more time and we're gonna to go to photo mode here. This is gonna be the last one that I show. And by the way, it's worth mentioning, in each of these modes, you'll pretty much see the option at the top where you can do single lens or 360. With most of these, especially the photo ones too, I recommend sticking with 360, like I said, unless you have a specific reason not to use it, I recommend sticking with it. It's gonna give you a lot more flexibility to reframe later on. So the nice thing about the standard photo mode is you can do 72 megapixels for the resolution. So that is one of the benefits of doing the standard one over the HDR one you do have a lot more flexibility there with megapixels as well. So you can do a lot more cropping in and it's still not gonna look pixelated. It's still gonna look pretty good. So for this, I recommend doing 72 megapixels. For the timer, it's gonna be like the HDR mode. You can do all the way up to 15 seconds. I generally keep it at three, but if you need to get back into the picture, keep it at something higher that gives you time to get back. We're gonna swipe left. And for this mode, I like to have the INSP plus raw because I like having that raw photo later on that I can edit and have a little more flexibility to really bring out the features in it that I want to. But if you don't think you're gonna want to do that, then you can go with pure shot. For white balance, same thing that we talked about with the other modes. For the EV comp, I recommend doing negative 0.5. It's gonna give you the most flexibility. For the isolated exposure, I recommend keeping that off. And something that's worth mentioning here, and this will apply for a lot of other modes as well, if you want some additional flexibility with settings, each of these you do have the manual here at the top. When you go to manual, it's gonna offer some additional options like ISO, shutter speed for each of those modes. However, what I find with this camera in particular is I find that the ISO and the shutter speed, I like the camera automatically adjusting those for me. On a lot of other cameras, I like to have control over those and change those, but I find this camera does a good job. And especially with 360, I want this camera to kind of select that average for me. Therefore, I did not show that because I do not recommend changing those unless you have a very specialized use case, in which case you would probably know what you'd want to set there anyway, if you have that type of use case. So if you're not sure what to set your ISO and shutter speed to, I recommend just leaving it auto and only changing these settings that I showed at the bottom. So I hope you found those settings to be helpful. The X3 truly is a camera that I've had a lot of fun with, and I've really enjoyed taking this on adventures and then afterwards reframing that footage and making some really cool shots. It is like having an entire camera crew with you, and that is where this camera really shines. And now that you have the best settings for filming with this camera, I am also going to be providing an extensive tutorial on how to reframe that footage later on the different options that you have and how to get the best results when reframing it.